Good morning. Uh, it's a real uh, pleasure to be here, and uh, I'm, I'm delighted that we've finally uh, come together. Um, as as been, has been mentioned, I couldn't really put the the hi historical kind of context in 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 place in in order in my mind, but it does feel like we've been talking about coming together for a long time. Uh, personally speaking, I really uh, appreciated the um, passage of time. It gave me a chance to think more uh, and to take more time and to actually produce a paper which I've um, which I think is is in the materials or, or will be. Um, and so I want to talk to you a little bit about this this paper, which is an, uh, the evolution of research that I really began um, some time ago, about about five years ago. Uh, as I was thinking about the misdeeds of CSIS and the RCMP in the prosecution of the war on terror, I uh, published uh, an article um, around that time. Uh, and there was this story that just grabbed my attention that I, I wanted to look into deep more deeply and I wasn't able to uh, pursue it in that particular paper. And so I've been looking at it, but I'm not a criminal law scholar and I'm, I'm talking about a criminal law case um, that, um, that, I, that, that I found fascinating. So I wanna share with you uh, a description of the case and some of my uh, preliminary thoughts on it as I try to situate it into uh, the broader themes uh, of the conference. Um, so uh, the case I'm talking about is um, a decision called RV Nuttall. The trial decision was uh, released in 2016 and the Court of Appeal, uh, the British Columbia Court of Appeal uh, upheld it mostly in 2018. Uh, and just this year was the launch of a civil proceeding uh, as Mr. Nuttall uh, and, his, uh, and his wife, uh, Amanda Cordy have sued uh, the RCMP uh, for damages, uh, for 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 damages arising from the facts that I'm going to describe to you, uh, and and what is uh, also available right now is a terrific CBC podcast. Uh, apparently, others uh, thought the story was as gripping as I did, uh, and have done a far better job of uh, presenting the story in an, in an entertaining and accessible manner in, in the form of a podcast called Pressure Cooker, which I highly commend. Um, uh, because they cap they capture everything uh, that is salient about this case. So uh, the basic facts: John Nuttall and his common law spouse Amanda Cordy were charged in relation to a plot to to bomb the provincial legislature of British Columbia in Victoria on July first, twenty thirteen. Uh, anybody that was alive and reading the newspapers at that time would have heard about this case because it was presented as such in the media as a terrorism plot uh, foiled. At the time, uh, the two of them were recovering heroin addicts who'd previously lived on the streets and had recently conver then recently converted to Islam. In October 2012, CSIS had actually reported that Nuttall was espousing violent Islamic ideas uh, to basically anybody that would listen to him. He was talking about wanting to fight a holy war in Afghanistan um, and that he was, according to CSIS, visiting a, quote, radical extremist mosque in Vancouver. Uh, the truth uh, ultimately is that there was never there was never any evidence that the mosque was extremist. Uh, in fact, uh, it it came to be shown that virtually every Muslim that Nuttall encountered uh, turned away from him when his views became known to them. In fact, he, the, the the pair were completely shunned by the community. had virtually had had absolutely no Muslim community uh, contact and were kicked out of the mosque that they had been attending. Um, the RCMP did an initial look into the pair and reported back to CSIS that they really couldn't find anything. They actually created um, a surveillance project, uh, tracked them for weeks, set up cameras around their house, uh, stake, stake out and, and the works. And all they saw was a, a couple of people uh, living a very boring life, uh, barely surviving, in fact. Um, yet the investigation continued uh, and CSIS continued to apply pressure on the RCMP to continue the investigation. And it appears that the central fact that had attracted CSIS's attention in the first place and maintained uh, the pressure uh, along the way was uh, the conversion of conversion to Islam of Nuttall and Cordy in combination with some of what Nuttall was saying, which absent the conversion to Islam quite likely would have been dismissed as uh, the ramblings of uh, a mentally unstable person. The court would later 
<clears throat> find, in fact, that not all knew virtually nothing about Islam and was not actually interested in learning about the religion. His interest was focused uh, only on extremist politics and the use of uh, violence. When officers began their surveillance of him, they found him at home in a basement apartment that he shared, uh, that he lived in with his grandmother. He was surrounded by empty liquor bottles and Islamic texts. He was high on marijuana. His uh, wife was with him. She identified herself as his wife and she presented wearing Islamic garb. Um, and this is essentially the picture that the, the surveillance uh, uh, painted. They would do very little all day, but smoke, drink, and play video games. They rarely left the house except to buy cigarettes, occasionally go to the pharmacy to buy prescription drugs for Nuttall's grandmother, which is what attracted Cesus's attention in the first place. Why is this guy going to the pharmacy so often? They didn't own a car. They rarely left their neighborhood. They were on uh, a no-fly list, but there was no record that they'd ever uh, held a passport or even left the country or even desired to leave the country. Um, the RCMP again reported back to CSIS, there's, there's nothing going on here, uh, which was responded to by a formal letter from CSIS to the RCMP advising that there was now new recent information that Nuttall had been attempting to purchase potassium nitrate from pharmacies. No source was provided um, and it appears, uh, the, the court later concluded that it appeared that CSIS formed this, the basis of this belief on simply Nuttall's patterns of going to the pharmacy to buy drugs for his wife. The, the, the pharmacy was never investigated. The pharmacist's records were never uh, looked at. It was basically a huge leap on the part of CSIS. Uh, and this is what launched what would become Project Souvenir. The authorized objectives of this investigation were to gather credible and admissible evidence to determine whether Nuttall was involved in any criminal or potentially criminal activity or had any knowledge of national security threats related to his radical Islamic beliefs. So you have in the grant of authorization for the investigation, a linking of his quote unquote radical Islamic beliefs, which were later shown to be hardly Islamic um, uh, and, and, um, uh, and just pure, purely, purely radical if, if, if even grounded in uh, any sort of coherent theory. Uh, the, the RCMP labeled the investigation as urgent, as a national priority, uh, and they, they carefully selected an undercover officer who had zero national security experience for the sole reason that he was Muslim and had Muslim knowledge and could use his Muslim knowledge to manipulate uh, the uh, investigation, to manipulate the, the, uh, the targets, actually. In order to gain Nuttall's trust, the undercover officer, actually, he used his knowledge and would counsel Nuttall on religious matters. Um, the court uh, found that Nuttall was an easy target. Uh, one senior officer testified that in his 34 years of policing, he'd never seen a target demonstrate such an openness and enthusiasm with respect to his terrorist beliefs in such a short amount of time. So um, by mid-March 2013, so there are a couple of months into the operation, some officers internally were expressing concern about this. They were saying, hold on a second, are we uh, pursuing a terrorist or are we actually making a terrorist? Uh, command officers ignored the warnings and concluded uh, that their, their assessment was, quote, given enough money, Mr. Nuttall would become a terrorist. And on that basis, they justified paying him more and more money. And so he did. Uh, he did continue to along, along the, the, the path that they were pushing him. Uh, the officers ignored warnings. Um, they ignored calls to uh, refer Nuttall for a mental examination, which might have halted the operation and shifted to a de-radicalization objective. It's worth noting that at this point, uh, the whole CVE uh, turn had not yet uh, been embraced. Uh, it's, it's worth considering whether there might have been um, an opportunity for him to be uh, subject to, to, to a different kind of intervention uh, and whether, uh, whether today's policies that are in place uh, would have led to a different outcome. Um, I'm not sure that it would have, uh, but that's not really the focus of, of the paper. Um, as the operation continued, the police engaged in several scenarios with the pair. All of this was, was designed to nudge them along towards carrying out the attack. Uh, but even these failed. And ultimately, uh, Nuttall was having a 
a, a, a crisis of faith uh, as he was um, as as he was doubting whether this terrorism plot that he was being pushed towards by uh, undercover agents whom he feared, whom he believed to be members of Al Qaeda and whom he believed would kill him if he didn't listen to them. Uh, but he, nonetheless, he was still hesitating because he wondered whether he would be right with God if he committed these acts. And he turned to the undercover RCMP officer posing as a, as a religious elder. Uh, and, and, and what did that officer say to him? He said, we'll hold, I'll hold your hand and we'll do this in, quote, baby steps. And that is exactly what happened. The trial judge found that over the next six weeks, Nuttall was uh, essentially handed the tools to develop uh, and execute a plan to set explosive device made from pressure cookers outside the legislature. The bombs were never viable. There was never any actual risk to public safety. Uh, everything uh, in, in the plot was under police control from the beginning. Um, okay, so the, Nuttall was actually convicted by a jury. Uh, and Nuttall and Cordy, his, his wife got, got, got kind of thrown into uh, the, the criminal uh, proceeding um, as well. And, uh, and it was after the conviction that the court held a voir dire, that's a, a separate proceeding to determine whether uh, the conviction should be set aside and the proceeding stayed on the basis that they, the pair were entrapped. This was found by the court to be a classic uh, or call it a modified Mr. Big operation. And Mr. Big operation is a controversial covert investigation procedure that the RCMP actually developed more than 50 years ago and has exported around the world. It's banned in the UK and in the US because um, it's, uh, well, it's very effective at uh, securing confessions from suspects in cold cases. That is in cases for crimes that have already been committed. The use of a Mr. Big operation in a, the context where there had been no crime uh, was, is, is virtually unheard of. And the court was quite rightly outraged by the police's use uh, because they actually used the, the, the procedure to uh, entrap the pair, to make them into terrorists rather than to secure confessions for something that had already occurred. Um, in my paper, I, I then look at a case that came out after R.V. Nuttall in the context of drug trafficking called R.V. Ahmed. It's a 2020 case. And in that case, the Supreme Court of Canada revisited the doctrine of entrapment, reconfirmed the doctrine of entrapment, and in the context of drug trafficking investigations, talked about the pervasive uh, uh, harm that racial animus, racial bias uh, plays out in, uh, in, in criminal prosecutions. And, ta and, and specifically talks about the link between racism and entrapment and the risk that as a result of systemic racism, uh, entrapment can be more likely, uh, the risk that entrapment occurs more frequently to racialized persons. All of this was done in the context of anti-Black racism and drug trafficking. Uh, none of that was uh, considered, not, none of that kind of analysis was considered by the British Columbia Court of Appeal in the Nuttall case, even though that kind of analysis would have been directly relevant. Um, and so um, I'm uh, the end of the paper and uh, the end of my, my talk, uh, which, I've, which I've reached, uh, is me sort of wondering, uh, how can we read Nuttall and Ahmed together looking forward? Um, how can we read Nuttall and Ahmed together looking backwards uh, at the history of, um, of, of uh, national security in this country? And I, I think that it behooves us to ask whether not all, which is generally considered a kind of anomalous case, is actually uh, a, a little sliver of insight into a culture of entrapment that has uh, shaped uh, the war on terror and Canada's uh, approach to uh, criminal prosecutions with respect to ter terrorism crimes. And if so, I think that represents a major shift in the way we ought to think about, um, about the way uh, our agencies are, are combating the risk of terrorism. Thank you very much.